I don't know really what I'm talking about, but it sort of gives you the general idea of what I mean. Um, you'll have to question me on it a bit more. But the, it is the last slide, and I think perhaps the last, sorry, it's the, it's the last slide but two. And the last two are purely two pictures of the building that I would most like to have done, had I done it. Next. That one. Yes, that's it. Well, the next one will do too. And that is Epidorus, um, where a built form of highly sophisticated geometry echoes and stabilizes the shape of the landscape. I think it's an absolutely stunning experience to go there and to know that the Greeks regarded their landscape as divine, occupied by gods, the hills, the arch of the sky, the sea, were all slightly more important than the buildings. But the buildings nevertheless extended the landscape. And to the pilgrims who came to that theater and looked down to the action, next, no, the last one I'll have, uh, being performed on the orchestra with the hills beyond where the sort of drama of life was being played out. Landscape, whether, as we call it now, urban or actual rural landscape, was really one and the same thing. Dennis has not only spoken in English, but he has spoken most movingly in English about his architecture. I'm sure you'll want to take this unique chance to put a question to him. I'm sure he'll do his best to answer. Yes, do ask, ask anything. Um, I'm uh, quite used to being questioned and challenged. It's very, very difficult to um, to make clear aesthetics. So, I mean, don't be shy about asking. I mean, I've disclosed m my cards, as it were. I mean, I've made it quite clear that I do not dismiss value judgments in the name of aesthetics at all. Nor do I think it's possible. It just gets more difficult as more and more people wish to participate in the process. But it is not an exclusive process. It cannot exclude formal action. They're all under his staff. I think they're all asleep. Yeah, yeah, do, do. Ask you, since you are talking about an architecture of strata, whether, say, falling water ever enter into your schema at all? Yes, must have done. And uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's work, which I should have paid tribute to, uh, of course is a hero and an influence. But I suppose subconsciously one puts him a little bit to one side, probably wrongly because he retreated from the city. And I do not retreat from the city. The city, for me, is embedded in the thinking. But he may, in the end, be, pr be proved to be the wisest old man of everybody. I don't know. But certainly, uh, you're quite right. Uh, unforgettable. I think really what I've been showing is that it's extended itself into the scale of city, which falling waters didn't. <coughs> Do you think that uh, if you practice as an idea, that your style has changed at all? That uh, it appears that uh, you had this initial concept of strata from the beginning and that the light your last project I think it's moving. I mean, I think it's developed. I think it's had its. I think the seeds I tried to show in the early 
jobs that it's there but you know as each job comes up with its unique problems you 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 exercise this view of things in a different way um, I imagine I would like to think that we're still developing it and that there are many many more moves I mean we're doing other buildings now which are quite different from the National Theatre although they are very much connected with the strata theme because they're public buildings and because I feel so strongly about buildings having to respond to public and private domains. I mean, I think this, this is a theme which I'm fascinated by because I think it is the closed institution which has a front door and nothing else blanked off that seals you from the life of the institution, which I'm against. We're not going to get rid of institutions. There's, they're they're here, here to stay and there are going to be a lot more of them. And the job of architects is to humanize them and make them more open. And strata is one architect's view of doing that. But it is only one way of doing it. You, you also hinted that uh, your vocabulary of architecture was of your own generation and not of uh, a new generation. How do you uh, uh, accommodate that philosophy to, to building new buildings in this generation? Well, no, I said the seeds, I, may, I should have said that the seeds were uh, sown in the 30s. And um, you see, I have, a, I have a curious, I suppose, attitude towards time and generations. I mean, I'm not terribly taken by fashion time or clock time. I'm rather interested in history time. It's a longer span. And to me, uh, I don't really know what I'm saying, but um, the 30s never was interrupted by the war. And I think, for instance, in the same way that I think about cubism, painters are not doing cubism anymore, but I think cubism is a rich quarry for architecture still. There's a lot to be got out of it still. I mean, the concept of interpenetrating planes or standing people on half levels is all really rooted in a sense, in cubism. Now, I evolved from that. It's no longer recognizable as what would have been done in the 30s. You won't find a building like the National Theatre, for instance, in the 30s. And, uh, all right, it was designed in the 60s, but in fact, in truth, it'll move out soon into history time, and God knows you might then say St. Paul's is a 60s building. Only it was 1860, or was it 1760? 1760. You know, I'm not... I'm not sure about the time thing. I am sure that there is tremendous relevance for me between the language being used and the problems being asked to be solved. And so I, I'm developing it. I mean, I'm more interested in that than I am in technology, for instance, per se. So the buildings are rather different. I admire that, uh, many of the highly technically charged buildings, but I can't do them. They don't mean the same thing to me. A specific aesthetic question. A bit the way elevation to your London University building, can you explain to me um, why there is this long, small unit monotony of, um, of the windows rather than it being built up from a... Uh, I didn't quite hear the first bit, sorry. Your, your Bedford Way elevation yes, yes. of your university building, the aluminium one. Can yes. you explain to me and, and, and uh, help me understand why, why the um, elevation is such a long, monotonous series of small units and isn't broken down in a, in a more sort of traditional um, aesthetic way, like Somerset House, for instance? Into smaller bits. Well, into, into it's from a larger bays that break into smaller yeah. bays and break into smaller bays. I find this rather zipped elevation. Yes. So um, intimidating. Uh, well, it's intimidating perhaps at the moment because it's unfamiliar. It's also unfinished. I have to tell you, it's going to get a bit longer. Uh, <laughs> and uh, there are, of course, uh, there's a lot of, I mean, I, I'll come to your point if I can. Um, um, there's a lot of landscape to take place and of course the building is not yet occupied and the variations in fenestration which come by inhabiting a building are not yet present. So it's an empty, dead thing until it gets occupied because buildings undergo an enormous change when they're occupied. 
But it is a hard elevation. It is hard to the traffic. Because a great deal of traffic is going up and down Bedford Way. And the size of the building is roughly the size of a Georgian terrace. It's about that, but it doesn't have the, the breakup and the interest which a Georgian terrace had. Do you mean it lacks the grace? Yes, I think it probably does at present, but I think that will change when it moves out of that particular way of looking at buildings into another way of looking at buildings. Now, a lot of things have got to happen on Bedford Way yet. There have got to be streetscape and signs of occupancy and, and habitation, which are simply not there yet. So one's prejudging it a bit. I think he was come back in five years with that question, and let's see what it looks like then. There will be a very marked difference in the appearance of that street. But it is a spine building protecting a precinct open to the public and to the students on the inside where the courts are private and the variation is on the inside, not on the outside where the traffic is. Do the, the buildings you design, are they buildings that you feel are uh, offering the most to uh, the future for people? Or would you rather design, say, a factory or a football ground, or, or you could do hundreds and hundreds of flats? You know, uh, do I like the buildings I've been asked to do? Oh, you've been asked, but it must be something to do with the type of person you are that you do those kind of buildings, maybe. Well, that's just luck. You, you, take, what you, you take what you get given. Uh, but I'm very happy with the buildings that we get given. I mean, I've only shown you uh, published buildings, which I picked the buildings for this talk, which you could actually go after this talk if you were interested, and confront the buildings and verify what was said. I have not included um, very interesting buildings that we're now doing, not in, Eng not in England, for instance. In, there's, uh, there's one building which I'm very interested in, uh, in, which is an institution building in Luxembourg, where this theme is very apparent. You can go and see a model of it in the exhibition at the Heinz Gallery, a very small model. But for instance, where the client uh, has said no air conditioning. Everybody must be able to open a window and be in contact, you know, with natural fresh air. And this poses very interesting uh, problems of a completely new order to anything we've done in the past. So the results are rather different. I'm absolutely delighted with the buildings I get given. In fact, one could say one's delighted to get given a building full stop. Have any other alternative sites that you've got the fourth theatre? <coughs> uh, well, the fourth theatre was the city itself. And you got that, didn't you? We were only offered two sites the one that I showed you, the first one, and then downstream. I mean, you have to take the site you're given. I had. Oh, yes, I had no say in the sites. None at all. Would you have liked it? No, I'm very happy with it. I think that's a wonderful site. I think it's a marvellous site. I mean, you couldn't ask for a better site in London. I couldn't ask for a better site in London. I think it's a, it's a marvellous site. Yeah? Your, your attempt uh, to, say to, to humanize it is the institution. Um, I can see uh, from your explanation in on the theatre mm. um, that you've attempted to formalize the entrance. Yes. Um, now, to some extent, there are certain uh, penalties because I've, I've done the theatre a number of times and I know that myself included, I've, I've approached it from a number of different directions. I've difficulty finding mm. the way in. Yes. And where, where, where is the front door? Yes. Um, and I suppose we'll get used to it. Yeah. I hope so. Not at all. I, you should be free. But, uh, your job is to criticize. That's what you're meant to be doing. I have got to take your criticism, think about it, and if I can give you a, 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 a good answer, then you will modify your view 
and if you can't make me give a good answer, I have to modify my view. I mean, that is the exchange that goes on between, uh, a healthy exchange that goes on between your teachers and, and, and yourself at all times. So you mustn't uh, worry about being critical. I'm just trying to think of my answer, except that the traffic, of course, I'm not in control of the traffic. So the traffic has to be rooted from the back. And the cars have got to get from the back to the front. And uh, so with it, you get, um, I mean, the real answer to you is that we should all approach the theatre from the north bank by barge. Yes. <laughs> and then all would be well. But I'm not able to do that. But that would be the answer. But what, the, what was the reason? Uh, now, you we've met before. Yes. yes. What was, sorry? The reason to put the entrance at that side. I, mean, I think it's, it's a, thing which, a theme which runs all over the south bank in a way. The Royal, the Royal Festival Hall is also have this situation where the entrance is from the riverside, but most of the people come from the back and uh, yes. this problem of uh, yes. the I, yes, yes. Well, Isn't Sorry. this a, a strong enough reason to ignore the view side of the building, the riverside, and to actually put the entrance in the side where people, most of the people, people come to the building? No, I don't think so. I think um, you're coming to the building anyhow, whether it's from Waterloo Station or from the North Bank. I think the building should offer you some sort of shelter from the elements as soon as possible, as soon as you get to it. But where the actual front door is, I don't think is all that important. What I do think is important is that the sort of life of the building which you experience when you're in it has got the maximum amenity to it. I think that is more important than where the entrance is. And that's the view I've taken. Uh, I dare say there are other solutions. I, I mean, I remember you telling me at the Heinz Gallery, you know, why wasn't the front door at the back? You also brought this point up and I thought about it and uh, I was rather lame on my answers. It's all so long ago. <laughs> But I think uh, you make too much of the entrance. All the same things. I think your Cambridge your Kim building does rather turn it back on the street, which the planners are possibly going to change. And I think there is a very definite back and utility area down there beyond the workshop. And I wonder if it's necessary. Where is it the theatre? The yeah. I wonder if it's necessary for buildings in our post nationalist era to demonstrate so clearly where their utilities are and where their uh, non-permeable membranes are. If I turn to your building in Regent's Park, I'm always amazed how marvelous your backside towards Albany Street is. It fits Albany Street beautifully, it seems to me, and completes Albany Street. And I wonder why, in other cases, you don't make streets at the backs of your buildings. Now, that's not very accurate. Um, the theatre has no street at the back. There is, a, there is what is called upper ground. There is no building beyond yet. Um, I personally think, you see, the back of the theatre, um, I like it very much, so I'm prejudiced. I mean, I like the blank wall. You said there ought to be a one-to-one -one relationship of what goes inside with the street, I seem to remember. Was that right? Yes, no. Sorry, but I'll keep on to draw. Uh, why should one have a backside and a front? I do not regard the back of the theatre as a backside. To me, it's just another strata of a different order coming down to the street. I mean, if you look at it with less prejudiced eyes like mine, it is just a strata uh, coming down to a road surface. Uh, the street has not yet taken wings because no building exists on the other side. There's nothing to relate to it. Nothing at all. It's an empty site. Now, if you come along with a commission to do a building opposite the backside, as you call it, of the National Theatre, I hope you will get inspiration from the building and gradually build up something else that will then live with the National Theatre. That you think is being facetious, I can tell by your smile. <laughs> but uh, it's not meant to be. I genuinely... I mean, these are awfully sort of personal 
I, 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 I remember being at the back of that building with Charles Jenks, who was to have been with you tonight, you know, and I, there's nothing about the back of the building, but I, I did have, a, for me, a very nice joke with him. It may not sound funny now, but it was very funny at the time. He said, of course, you ran out of steam when you got to the back. I mean, it's, he just dismissed it, you know. Um, and he said, anyhow, the whole building bothers me. It doesn't express a theatre. I mean, look at those towers up there. And he pointed to those towers which have slots in them behind the fly tower, and he said, they look like air conditioning towers. And I said, that's what they are. <laughs> uh, so, you know, one, all, one, I don't know why I tell you that, so I really shouldn't have told you without him here to defend himself. But I remember he also thought the back of the theatre was uh, um, uh, questionable. I really do like, I'm bound to say that by the time we've got our beautiful signs up saying National Theatre and poster, uh, displays on and trees and seats, it will be absolutely smashing and a wonderful piece of strata. I guess I, I, I speak because uh, I speak in this way because at one time, working in the RCC, I was responsible for the design for the extension of the festival hall. And the design which we did insisted that the entrance should be on what was at that time as much potentially a street as any other of our. Mm streets in London, part of the street network, but uh, I didn't see it through, I left, and two years later after the designs had been revolved a few times, it turns out that the uh, festival hall has a kind of back on that side, too. And mm. I regard that myself as a little bit sad and uh, see it really as an extend, extension of the 30s where mm. yeah, you are a functionalist I think no 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 no, no. Well, perhaps you inherited something from Corbusier oh uh, yes that idea that straight way of regarding buildings as things that uh, certain instances turn their backs on the traffic and mm. their fronts towards the view I certainly feel that about the Cambridge yes, yes. directed at the best side, and I sometimes wonder if you're ever going to get back to a truly civic architecture of the city, unless all the parts of our building are as polite to the city and as civic in their essence as is Somerset House. Well now, I must take you up on the word functionalism, because it's a great myth. The, if you identify the word functionalism with the 30s, functionalism was never an ism, it was purely the purifying role of an architectural process. It was never anything more. No, none of the good architects of the functionalist period ever believed that if you conducted your architectural affairs in a functionalist methodology, that that would lead to architecture. I mean, it has never been that. Corbusier has never preached it. Gropius has never preached it. None of the great masters have ever preached this. But for some reason, it, it's got a tag, functionalism, which has done a lot of damage, I think, to, to architecture. That's on the word functionalism. On the word, you know, aren't we being polite enough on the back of the theatre? I thought when I showed you the slides, next time I speak to the AA, I will start with a slide of the back of the theatre. <laughs> but in the meantime, I thought the National Theatre and Opera House, which you saw a model of, had absolutely dissolved buildings into what you call polite civic strata. It had dissolved buildings. There were no fronts and no backs. And if that is true of that model, then we wouldn't have abandoned it on the building, not mentally at any rate. If that's what you see in it, well then I, I've got to ask you to look at it again. Try and understand it in a different way, because it's not what it was intended. Not at all. But of course, there's a catch in a way, because the National Theatre is a sort of collision organically between a cathedral and a factory. I mean, that's actually what it is. Now, you could bury the factory and say, well, I'm only the cathedral on the top. Or if you're going to sort of have daylight and this sort of thing, what are you going to do with the factory? You know, it poses very difficult problems. That's, by the way, I mean, I defend to the hilt 
the back of that theatre. I don't think it needs any defence, I think it can speak for itself. It just isn't quite finished yet, like the rest of the buildings. Can we move off into something else? Uh, Sorry. You have, in fact, taken a classical picture of a bridge and a fortress. Bridge and a? A bridge and a fortress. Yes. And, and your language is the language of, 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 of uh, defense and fortress, and magnificent, strong language it is, with towers and slit, slits and walkways and so on. But a fortress, like a theater, is a blind building, and, and like a prison also is a blind building. And most theaters get away from this by having large, elaborate entrances, and you've had the courage to do away with that. Uh, you, uh, this yeah. is no Paris Opera House. This is no great portico and so on. This is, yeah. this is a building which contains what it has, but it still is the language of a fortress. It's Castle Angelo on Waterloo Bridge. Now, do you object to fortresses? I mean, in fact... Do you no, 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 no. I, I get great, uh, great enjoyment out of it. Because, you see, in a sort of curious way, a theatre... You out of your theatre. A theatre is a fortress, in a way. I mean, it really has got to protect the word from outside noises, amongst other things. It has to be a heavy, dense building. I mean, I, you may find that rather weak, but... Um, it is a sort of a fortress. Yes, it is. I don't mind for I rather like fortresses. Well, I like it. Sure. I think most of us do, but but but, you but think it, it is, is the language. Most of your language is I mean in another a hundred years ago, I think for the way Burgess would have dealt with it, yes. with, with great um, with, uh, with the winding uh, and so yes. on. You've done away with this, but well, there's no money for them. the theme is the same. Yes, I mean it is a budget building, of course. There's no money for the grand staircase. I wasn't suggesting that you should have had that. No, no I know you were. Yes, the undercroft. Um, it seems to me that you've expressed two things very strongly that you could have one is, is what you might call the, the quality of ambience around your building, mm. and the other is, is, is structural expression. Mm. Now, uh, at East Anglia, it seems to me that the quality of ambience worked very well in some places, mm. and the structural expression worked together with it in some places. Now, one of the most peculiar parts of, the, of those residences, struck me, is around the back. You're talking about uh, the ambience of the residences in East Anglia. Uh, and uh, about to make a uh, what I think will be an important criticism. Yeah. Um, <laughs> no, I mean that genuinely. Uh, what, what struck me about back where the, where the cars are parked yeah. is that it seemed to be, in some sense, a residual space in which um, there were powerful expressions of structure, admittedly, but in some sense uh, the quality of ambience had, had fallen away. Yes. Because I could never decide really whether that road, I mean I lived in those places, mm. I could never really decide whether that road was meant to be used as a conscious space or whether it was a, a purely uh, monofunctional aspect in which you drove your car and, and whether the entrances to each hole were a little more than holes in the ground. Yeah. Would you try? In fact, as a matter of usage, you know, 50% of the time you went up to the battlements, as it were, and you went up yes, to the yes, yes. walkway. Yeah. And then, um, at other times, you uh, went up walking um, along the back and, and dotting cars back. Yes. And in fact, at other times, you lived, if you lived near the ground, you just got out to the window. Yes. And yes. yes. But I wondered about whether you end up finding yourself with residual spaces in which um, certain uh, of, of your aspirations as regards the quality of ambience, etc., don't work out. Well, I think you're on to a very good point. And what I really want to do, you've got the... Uh, did you get his criticism? The back of East Anglia Terrace, particularly the Undercroft, presents a fairly... Uh, What's the best word for it? Uh, well, backside, just a hole in the wall to tell you there's a front door with no, uh, nothing to entice you along that road at all. Well, it wasn't nothing to entice you uh, 
in, in a sense, I, it was highly convenient to use that road to walk along, mm. um, uh, to get to certain places. It, it's just that um, it didn't seem con considered in the same sense that the sun is so Yes. Um, and, and this is almost slightly peculiar in the sense that it was actually backside because it does face on to the main teaching. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I think you're on to a very important point. This um, hill formation that one's been doing produces an undercroft and he is really saying is the undercroft a leftover space or is it properly organized within the whole concept? Am I, is that a fair assessment? Well, I think that's, a, I think that's a, an extremely good comment. I think it shows that we haven't yet grasped the significance of this theme. It ties up a little bit with your one-to-one -one relationship. I suppose it gets nearer home in Christ where it's organized into shops and car parking. So there's a motive behind it. I think this is a question of evolution, but I think you've made a, a valid comment. Uh, it must be valid because you lived in the bloody place, so you know. Um, I think it's a, it, it is a point. What I find very interesting about this whole questioning from Bob onwards is that if you were in the office, we never think of fronts and backs. I mean, it is something obviously that we project in our buildings to other people, but when we're thinking about them, there is no talk. This is the back of the building. It doesn't exist as a conversation with anybody. So you well, began to uh, demonstrate yeah. during for five minutes. Yeah. Yes. One of the main general <laughs> criticisms about the um, theatre and the cave buildings around the Royal Festival Hall is that they lack colour. And it seems to me very odd that you should have isolated certain aspects of Kabuzi as well, particularly the structural aspects and the more formal aspects of playing and solid surfaces and so on, and not mentioned at all an interesting Kabuzi use of colour, both inside buildings and outside buildings. I wonder in fact whether colour is very important to you as an architect. Not at all. Well, I think the major criticism there is about the National Theatre is that it's a grey building and a very hard material, which during the day responds very well to changes in sunlight, the surface colour seems to change. Yet when night comes down and the building is in full use, the contrast again is a black and white contrast because you're mainly losing, using white light from inside the building and it makes the building then appear as a, a dark silhouette and it's not relieved in any way by colour. People seem to feel, generally, when everyone's talking about participation and community action, yes. a real problem with modern architecture exists in terms of its surface materials and in the way those materials are to yes. um, the organisation of the building. Well, you've shifted. You've, sh you've yes. shifted from colour to surface. Yes. But uh, now, if you'd ask me... The, sorry? Yeah. would be very much relieved of their boredom by the use of colour, particularly in the um, areas leading from car parks to the building itself, the, the, the building itself. I don't sense this at all. I mean, I, having said no to you on colour, I'm not in the least impressed by your Corbusier uh, analogy because he worked in a Mediterranean light and this is an English light where I think colour looks absolutely tawdry. Um, that's a personal view. I can't yeah, be dogmatic. Well, even there, I'm not crazy about them. But that is personal. When you come to, say, make a criticism on surface, that there's not enough surface interest, then you're beginning to interest me because you're entering into the fabric of architecture. Well, this is arguable. One cannot be dogmatic on that. But my answer to you is something entirely different. I don't wish to change anything about the surface of the National Theatre, either day or night. 
because I wish it to match and rhyme with the bridge, which it does. What I do want to see are people and markets and second-hand bookshops and stalls entirely surrounding the building and on the terraces, just as you saw in the equivalent in Piazza San Marco. That would bring interest to the building. But painting one bit green and another bit yellow is not for me. I personally, once I hand the building over, I will be prepared one day to come along, as I did in a very early house of mine, which I did in Paddington years ago, which had beautiful Dutch tiles, very nice surface, very nice dark brown color. And the client, 30 years later, a new client, painted the whole thing bright yellow. I mean, it doesn't please me. It upsets me. May I follow up on that question, um, You mentioned your television interview with Peter. I can't hear. You mentioned a television interview with Peter Hall, that you would like to see lit lichen grow in your building in a few years' time yeah. when you were criticized about the surface of the building, i.e. concrete. And you also, I think, inferred in your answer to various questions about other buildings of yours today that you visualized a kind of maturity of the building in years to come. Yes. I did and say that. And now, just now, Dennis's question, you said that you probably would not like to see your building change in any way into all colors and so on. No, no, no. No, 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 no. I said I didn't want to change it to color. Well, I meant to say that. I, did, I also said that when I'm finished with the building, somebody may paint it. I wouldn't want to paint it. I want it to be streaky, blotchy, and full of lichen. Self-coloring. Self-coloring, yes. Because I think it's by the river. It's... The river is a sort of greyish thing, and I want it to live by the river. I don't want it to assert itself in any way. And my point is that um, seeing what happened in London recently, where you know authorities kept spending money in cleaning up buildings, what would happen to your anticipation if that should happen to your building? If, if, if your authorities have... I don't like clean buildings. You see. I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't. But what would happen to your conception of your, your anticipation of the appearance of your building if that should happen? Well, it would be out of key, as this house that's been painted yellow is out of key. I mean, it's not anything that I would personally welcome. But I mean, the buildings have their own life, their own personalities, and they take on new lives. Once you finish doing them, they belong to history and time and other things happen. But if you ask me what I would like to happen, and what is much more important, what was designed to happen, that's the crucial thing. It was designed knowing that that we were not going to get material either inside or outside the building. Enormous care was taken with the grading, the quality, the color, the handling of the concrete. And really enormous trouble, not only by ourselves, but by the concrete operatives who actually handled the shuttering and the substance itself. So that I have an almost uh, love affair with the concrete. I don't want it touched except that a north face will weather differently from an east face, and an east face will weather differently from a west, and so on. And the white streaks that go up those towers, to me, is time and architecture, and I like that. You spoke of trees at the back when, you, when it's all finished. Will there be planting in the front as well? Yes. There will, there will be. What the Japanese do is so well is marry their planting with their concrete buildings. Yes. And there will be quite a bit of There are already several trees in and there's going to be a lot more. I mean, and, and not only in the front of the building, on the terraces as well. I mean, it is meant to be, you know, I tried to sort of signal it in the, in, in the talk, that one was, uh, one was after little bits of park, little bits of greenery, plus the city, because it's a sort of extension of bits of the city. And, uh, but you see, we live in a time when economy is really the yardstick of everything. And you can't get money except in little bits and pieces, and you have to wait patiently while architectural critics tear you to pieces, because your building's not even finished, it hasn't become part of nature yet, it hasn't had time. But one learns to live with it. I think we've got time for a couple more questions, only one or two here. Right. Um, you both had it over before. 
to, to, to do with, uh, I, I more or less agree with your remarks about tampering with the surface and the colour of the concrete, but could I just ask you if you have any attitude to the use of neon? Neon? Yeah. One thing that I've always liked about neon is that it is literal in the sense that it stands out uh, literally and distinguishes itself from the, from the carrier. Yeah. Um, in, well, again, in East Anglia, there was a, a very nice coffee bar in, right in the centre, which you know about, which I thought was beautifully placed and extremely well used. There's only one thing that was wrong with it. No one actually had a name for it. The base is called the Goldfish Bowl. And I thought, well, supposing someone got some neon and, and put the Goldfish Bowl over it, um, it would be a way of, of acknowledging a certain uh, Usage of the identity. Of mm. Well, I got. To, I, I'm not going to absolutely directly answer. I would hate to see neon, really, but it does bring up an issue which I I dropped an awful brick the other day at a talk on some sculptors because I uh, what I really say is that I like advertising neon sculpture, call it what you will, but I like it in terms of juxtaposition and not imposition. I like the two activities to live freely, side by side. Do you see what I mean? I don't like stuff stuck on a building, but I like freedom of different activities, such as advertising, living with a building. I like sculpture freely living with a building. I don't like it as part of the building. Which is presumably why I don't like colour, I don't know. I, I, the building is separate. Uh, something uh, not so much related to uh, your architecture. Uh, you are, I think it was elected, you were elected to uh, council of the AA. No, I'm not answering any questions on council matters. No, but uh, can you, can you uh, speak about, about the AA, your attitude to it? And I think it's a splendid school. <laughs> and uh, what kind of association is it? I don't know, but I think it's a splendid place and we'd be lost without it. <laughs> <laughs>